to talk a little bit about craft. And when I talked to my staff at Eight Shapes, we're a small, small UX agency, I said, what comes to mind when you think the term craft? And the quotes that I got were quality, beauty, beauty consistency, precision, tools. It almost evoked uh, the metaphor that we used to talk about of put on the headphones and crank through really great, in our case, digital user experiences. In today's world, and like we heard, this is more than just putting on your headphones and working in your tools to produce something that's beautiful. And as we think about culture and the theme of the conference, it's really going to provoke us to think about our role within a broader ecosystem of people. So we're going to have to think about what are the processes and systems and collaboration and, and inclusivity and what does it mean for me to practice my craft and I have to yield to the collective and perhaps yield a little bit of the autonomy that I have in the practice that I work on. And so when we're talking about digital interfaces, let's start with the basics. Let's start with the core thing that invites interaction itself. If you're making an experience, it is the button. And when we work on digital experiences, it's actually the button where a lot of the rubber meets the road of your design. You think about all of the important decisions of your design's language your typography, your color, both of type and of fields of color, the shape that your digital interface elements have, and also, in the most complicated way, how we create space and separation to create contrast and other attributes of our visual system. And buttons are supposed to be easy, right? As affords the interaction, it says, click me, wait, let's get on to the more complicated problems. But if we're practicing our craft, we need to solve buttons across a range of cases. There's not just one button on a page, there's often a secondary button, or maybe there's a flat button, or maybe there's even a ghost or outline or window button, just a little bit of a tip. They're called ghost buttons because they disappear in usability tests because people can't see them on the page. So be careful. But when you're making systems, you have to think about all of these different uses and how you're going to apply them in your experience. That's part of the craft. And so we start to think about, well, when we interact, we need to think about not just the rest state, but all of the different interactive states that a button might have across the different types. And then we need to realize that actually button isn't an atomic element of our experience. The icon is the thing that we, we reuse the most, and it's an icon that we actually use in the composition of button. That opens people's minds to think, wow, something so tiny, so simple, is actually a composed pairing of a label and another component called an icon. And maybe in our systems, we need to have different sizes of elements, or we need to consider all of these different properties. So as you make a button and you're thinking about types and states and composition and size and theming and they have to work across all these elements and they need to be work in a responsive environment and be fully accessible. Buttons themselves reveal the craft necessary to create a digital experiences at a high level of quality. And so let's talk about the button and the select menu and the text box and the form label and all of our different pieces of type. Those are components we use to create interfaces. And they all rest upon a design language, what I'll, we'll just call visual style. Color, typography, iconography, space is hard, okay? Borders, shapes, all those other properties we apply to the interface. And we need to create those and then reuse them over time because when you have a system and you wanna make a product experience, you start with this blank canvas that you're gonna author that experience on. And it's only through all those interface elements that when you compose them with visual order using a grid and you start to compose your overall layout of your experience, then you've created something that solves a problem. You have a system that solves a problem for people creating that product experience. But you're creating a product experience because people need to design what it's like to authenticate, for example, in a digital experience. And so we as designers, we use the tools of the day and it used to be Photoshop. It used to be Illustrator. Now, I've got to admit, at large companies, the tool of the day is Sketch. And now, Sketch is also under a lot of competition for other rising software packages, too. Again, back to the tools. And what tool do we feel comfortable in? What do we feel individually comfortable in? But it's not just about us as designers. Like we heard in our introductory remarks before, it's also the relationship that we have with an engineer who should be using the same system, 
Whoever thought, when you saw the system on the left, you thought, okay, that looks like what I see in Sketch, that looks like what I see in Photoshop. That is what engineers see in their tool set too. And if you can unify those things together, you create a dialogue, a vocabulary, a language to share with your teammates, in particular developers, designers, and other people that tend to form a squad. And then you're creating a system within your squad and then you realize actually we need a system for all six of our teams. Or you realize you need a system for all 60 of your teams. And so all of these tiny bits, you might have thought, wow, button, so trivial. When it's used across such a massive scale of all these different teams, the people making those systems have to practice craft at an extremely high level of quality. The quality of what they do has to exceed what any individual person would have done on one of those products because everyone has to believe their toolkits are better than what they would have had to do themselves. And so we think about these teams and we put ourselves in our sort of traditional mold of I'm going to create some design assets, we've got this design team over here, maybe we'll make a documentation site they can go, and we're going to serve our design community. And let's leave it, maybe we'll talk to the engineers over there, but we'll leave it to them to create their code toolkits. The way that systems are evolving within large companies trying to scale and solve these problems is that they're actually taking the members of both those teams and forming what is a team serving teams. Whether or not it's your full-time job, and many people do have a full-time job doing this as a part of a team serving those other teams, you start to take that empathetic mindset we heard about, and you start to look at your customers, all of the other people around your organization that you collaborate with. And so as you think about your role and you think about is this real, all the big companies are doing it. If you've used a Google product, You've seen material design, which started as an effort to create this kind of language shared across all these teams. We'll hear from a speaker from Airbnb, IBM, Atlassian, even Salesforce. We'll hear from a, uh, someone who participated in the Salesforce Lightning design system, where they have principles by which they created the system that serves everyone. And my favorite has always been the fourth. And I've always been uncomfortable with this because I'm not like a beauty person. That's not part of my core language. But craftsmanship is. And when you make things with a high level of craft, you're demonstrating a respect for people's time and intention through your thoughtful and elegant craftsmanship. And so that's what we're here to think about. And when you hear me talk about a design system and the systems that we use in the day-to-day -day work of creating digital experience, you could look at it like it's a toolkit. You've got some visual style. It's applied through all the UI components. Now we can design consistently. That's great. You can look at it like it's a program. OK, now we're starting to make this a part of some people's jobs. And it's so that we all together can make consistent products more efficiently at a high level of quality. But I'd also encourage you to think about it's actually about culture. And it's a culture in which people are going to be making those design decisions together and creating tools that embed those design decisions that not only they've made, but that will have to endure and change over time. Mm -hmm.